started here. So if everybody that's uh, still standing and uh, chatting, if you can find a seat, there are plenty of seats it looks like out there. We'll go ahead and get this started. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ed Hartman. I'm DAD's Inspector General, and uh, I'll be tag teaming this uh, seminar with Brian Cohort, our Chief Development Officer, who, after I get done presenting, will talk a little bit about fundraising. But uh, I want to start off today and uh, kind of get back to the basics a little bit about DAD and who we are, what we do, what we're, our responsibilities are at the chapter level, at the department level. So I decided to uh, talk a little bit about the Constitution and bylaws. Of course, we all know that each entity of DAD, whether it be a chapter, department, or the national organization, has bylaws that govern and dictate everything that we do at every level. So we're going to... Uh, uh, spend a little time uh, talking about our Constitution and bylaws at the different level um, and some of the things that apply within the national bylaws that are very specific to departments and some things that are very specific to um, chapters. So as we all know, um, there's not one person in any DAB entity, whether it be the chapter, the department or the national organization that unilaterally makes the decisions of the organization, right? So at the department level, we know that the supreme authority of any DAD department is the convention and the delegates assembled and gathered at the department convention. So resolutions made, uh, ideas made, issues that are voted upon and approved by the body of NET or the department convention is the supreme authority of the department convention. The DEC obviously uh, addresses issues that occur in between department conventions. So um, the caveat to that is that even though the DEC makes decisions in between department conventions, the DEC cannot undo something that was voted upon by the delegates assembled and gathered at the department convention, with a few exceptions as it relates to officers and appointments, so on and so forth. But uh, absolutely the most supreme authority of a department is the delegates assembled and gathered at that convention. Each and every year, it's uh, required by the National Bylaws in Article 8, Section 8.3. And just for your reference, in the National Bylaws, everything is segmented uh, into very specific articles. So if you're looking for something that's specific to departments, you're going to find that in Article 8. Everything from conducting convention, adopting bylaws, electing officers, so on and so forth is going to be in Article 8. Everything that relates to chapters, you're going to find in Article 9. But uh, since we're talking about departments here, Article 8, Section 8.3 of the bylaws require that each and every year a department must annually elect a commander, a senior vice commander, one or more junior vice commanders, and shall either elect or appoint an adjutant, state inspector, and treasurer. So what does that mean? There has to be an annual election of officers. That doesn't mean that the the commander cannot succeed himself or herself. It just means that you have to afford the opportunity of the body to elect somebody. Now, the national bylaws do not dictate or govern the department's bylaws in terms of whether or not a commander can succeed him or herself. That's the discretion of the body. That's the discretion of the Constitution and bylaws of the department. Many departments allow for department commanders to succeed themselves uh, for two years, uh, three years, you know, into um, the future. Others require that uh, commanders only serve one single period. When we talk about um, appointing or electing an adjutant, treasurer, and a state inspector, that's, again, the pleasure of the um, department by way of its bylaws. Um, so, but keep in mind, any appointment that is made by the commander for those positions must be ratified by the department executive committee uh, or the body uh, in order for it to be in full force and effect. 
Um, also, it's very, very common in many departments that the department adjutant and treasurer are one and the same person. There's no prohibition to that. The only prohibition uh, in the national bylaws as it relates to department officers is that the department commander may not serve as the adjutant. The senior vice commander may not serve as the adjutant. So if your department is in, has uh, within its bylaws the fact that the commander appoints an adjutant, appoints a treasurer, uh, he or she may not appoint him or herself as the adjutant or the treasurer. Immediately following the election of officers and the department convention, uh, officer reports have to be submitted within 10 days. The reason that we do that is because, of course, as you all know, there's a great deal of information coming out from the national organization as it relates to legislative items, uh, issues that affect, uh, each, in some cases, state specifically. It may be related to disaster relief efforts, uh, maybe related to a very important issue taking place in that state. We need to know who we're communicating with, who to send correspondence to, uh, who's the person in charge uh, of the department that we need to be communicating with. And unless we have that officer report, we have absolutely no idea who that is. Now, occasionally within a department, changes are made within the line or within the leadership uh, throughout the course of the year for any number of reasons, death, uh, disability, uh, resignation, removal. If that occurs, that requires the creation of a new officer report so that, again, we can continue that uh, uh, line of communication and make sure that we are communicating effectively and appropriately with the correct individual. Annual financial reports must be submitted. We, and we all know that our annual financial reporting period is always July 1 to June 30 each and every year. Uh, that is our membership year, that's our accounting year. So Article 8, Section 8.4 requires that annual financial reports of the department must be submitted to the national organization um, prior to September 30th of each year. Um, every department must file a report with the national organization. What do we do with these annual financial reports when we get them? Uh, we look to make sure that uh, Funds are being appropriately spent on service programs. We look to make sure that the accounts balance, make sure that there's full accountability. Um, we look at them most importantly for many departments when we are considering a grant from the Columbia Trust to support either your department service program, your hospital service coordinator program, the DAD Transportation Network, if you're ordering vans and requesting some assistance from the Columbia Trust. The Columbia Trust cannot um, evaluate and consider a grant request from a department until we have that annual financial report. And we all know that vans come available and are usually announced in the fall. So uh, I would say better than half the time we get requests in from the, for the Columbia Trust from departments to help fund vans for the transportation network or to uh, fund its service program or its hospital service uh, coordinator program. Um, and we absolutely cannot do anything until we get that financial report. So that requires us to reach back out to the departments, uh, encourage them to get those reports in because until we get that report, we cannot consider a grant because the Columbia Trust, as we all know, is a needs-based um, entity. So if there's a true need for funding by a department to support our programs of service, the Columbia Trust is going to support it. The only way that we know that is by way of reviewing and evaluating the annual financial report. Uh, some of the other things we look at on the annual financial report is to ensure that, uh, I mentioned that funds are being spent appropriately. Um, we cannot raise money in the name of DAD and then turn around and make a donation to another um, uh, organization. Now the caveat to that is, is if uh, there's another veteran service organization that is uh, hosting a very specific event that is benefiting disabled veterans and their families, we can make a donation to that organization because we can justify to our donors that the funds that were received by DAD from the general public we're being used to support a very specific program to disabled veterans, to support disabled veterans and their families. 
what we can do is just make blanket um, non-binding donations to organizations just because we like the organization. And we all have to remember that you know the funds that are donated to DAV at all levels, the national organization, departments, and chapters um, are from the general public. We don't get any government funding. Um, at the national level, I know some departments get funding from the state, but we have an obligation to spend that money in accordance with our charter purpose. Uh, we're going to find ourselves in trouble if uh, we're making donations to programs or organizations that are not beneficial to disabled veterans in their programs. So um, we cannot and should not be making donations to programs such as Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the police department, the local fire department, churches, things of that nature. And we do run into those from time to time on annual finance reports, and we're very quick to respond to those, to reply to those, because um, the entity that is making those donations uh, using funds that were provided by the general public to support DA's, DAV's mission is going to quickly dry up if they learn that uh, that entity of DAV made a donation to the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, a church, the local fire department, the police department association, whatever the case might be. We have to spend money on our uh, federally chartered purpose of providing service to veterans and their families. Um, any department that has income that exceeds $300,000 during the course of the accounting year, excluding anything that comes from the national organization. So funding that comes to a department from the national organization includes membership dues distribution, the department fundraising program, and then any grant that it may receive from the Columbia Trust. So just as an example, if, uh, a, ch if a department received $200,000 in donations from uh, entities throughout the state and then received a, another $120,000 for membership distribution, department fundraising programs, and Columbia Trust, that certainly exceeds $300,000, right? So, we don't care about the money that comes from national because we can account for that. We know what came to the department. If all those other donations uh, that come in during the course of the year exceed $300,000, that's the benchmark that would require the department to get a CPA review uh, prior to the submittal of the annual financial report of the department. Um, years ago, the bylaws were amended. That used to read a CPA audit, and CPA audits are very, very, very expensive. Sometimes, depending upon the size of the department, the amount of money that we're talking about can be $15,000, $20,000, $30,000. Uh, and certainly, the last thing that we want to have happen is uh, require departments uh, to spend a large sum of money just to have an accounting. So a CPA review, much less expensive, uh, but it covers the same aspects of a CPA uh, audit. Um, it will identify any inconsistencies within the accounting of the department for the year, which might prompt a, a further audit. So um, that does not happen very often, but uh, we have found that a CPA review is A, uh, considerably uh, less expensive, but then also covers a majority of what is included in an audit and would uh, um, satisfy our questions and our needs to determine you know, where money's going, uh, how it's being spent, and A, most insured, or most importantly, to ensure that it's safeguarded and protected. So a lot of uh, departments have uh, districts um, much like the national organization, we have districts, right? So we've got 21 districts in DAV National. Uh, each one of those districts are represented by a national executive committeeman that we uh, adopt here at National Convention. Um, the same thing applies and is, is allowed within departments. Uh, but the one thing that is very, very, very specific in Article 8, Section 8.7 of the bylaws is that much like the national organization in our NEC, 
the NEC as an, in, as an individual, as an, uh, a district, its own unique district, has no power, no authority. So there should be no um, district commanders. I know that there are still many departments and we're working with some departments uh, as we identify them that do have quote unquote district commanders to change the title of that individual to a district executive committeeman. Uh, what we've found in the past is that uh, when we have district commanders and someone's handed the title or elected as a district commander, now all of a sudden they have a belief and an understanding that, well, I'm a district commander, I command all these chapters in my district. And as pointed out in 8.7, districts have no authority. They have no power, no authority. The only reason for a district to exist is to provide information and serve as a conduit of the chapters that district represents with the department and then back and forth. Um, so uh, there cannot be, since they're not chartered entities, districts are not chartered entities of DAV, so therefore no employer identification number exists for districts. Um, there can be no fundraising being conducted by a department district. There can be no financial accounts maintained in the name of the district. As it relates to fundraising uh, activities in terms of the fraternal side of DAV uh, within the departments, everything that a department uh, does related to fundraising um, must receive the prior approval of the National Executive Committee with the exception of uh, the pre-approved um, maybe not fundraisers that departments are authorized already in our bylaws to conduct. There's no prior approval needed by the NEC. Plus also the annual uh, Golden Corral Military Appreciation Monday fundraisers that uh, are coordinated by the national organization and are intended as a department fundraiser. Those are the only two things that do not require uh, annual approval from the National Executive Committee. But anything and everything else that a department uh, uh, requests or desires to do in terms of fundraising must get the prior approval of the National Executive Committee. Um, these are these are just commonalities and, and, and uh, um, issues that we deal with on a daily basis from departments. Um, so when we talk about fundraising, you know, we're always asked about always asked questions about uh, how to get approval for certain fundraisers. But just keep in mind, if you're a department leader, anything and everything minus golden crown, forget me not, must be submitted to the National Executive Committee for prior approval. Excuse me. Ed. We'll, we'll ask some questions at the end. Thank you. Um, disciplinary action. Um, that's, something that, that's something else that we deal with uh, pretty regularly. And we all know that as department leaders, there are only two people in any state that can, can initiate Article 16 disciplinary action. And that's the department commander and or the national commander. Um, now, disciplinary action as it relates to an individual's membership is governed by Article 16 of the bylaws and further by way of NEC Regulation Number 6. Um, not every infraction of a member requires disciplinary action. Because remember, um, at the end of the day, the National Commander, if, if a suspension is issued for the purpose of conducting an Article 16 against a member, that suspension has to be upheld by the national commander. <clears throat> so the very last thing that anyone wants, especially as a department leader or even us at the national uh, organization, is to have a department commander sus improperly suspend somebody, send the letter out, and then when that copy of the letter gets to the national commander and the national commander overturns it, um, you know, that just adds fuel to the fire. Now the individual is, is kind of thumbing their nose at the department saying, see, I told you so, you don't know what you're doing. So what I would encourage is that if you're a department commander, if you're a department adjutant, and you have an issue that you believe might require disciplinary action, um, 
against an individual's membership, pick up the phone and uh, give me a call before any letters are issued, before any statements are made, because I have a pretty good barometer as to whether or not the national commander would support and uphold um, an Article 16 letter going out against a member, suspending their membership, conducting an investigation, which might ultimately lead to a, an Article 16. There are other things that we can do uh, besides Article 16s. We can provide a letter of reprimands. We can, you know, work with them. I've, on occasion, taken the opportunity to call the individual myself and kind of reason with them and and uh, explain to them why uh, what they did was wrong and what they can do to fix it. Article 16 should really, really be the last resort. However, that being said, there are some things that absolutely positively uh, require Article 16 disciplinary action immediately, um, whether that's dealing with uh, uh, assaults, uh, theft, um, and, and a whole host of other things. But um, do yourselves a favor if you're a department leader, department commander, department adjutant, before you suspend anybody, um, and then send that copy of the letter into the national commander. Pick up the phone, give me a call first. Um, because I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll be able to tell you whether or not uh, the national commander is likely to uphold it or overturn it. Because we want to work with the departments and we want to be, the department leaders are our uh, conduits with its members and its chapters. We want to support the decisions of the department. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really embarrassing sometimes when we, when the national commander overturns a suspension and then really, like I said earlier, adds fuel to the fire and empowers that individual that had just been suspended and is now overturned by the national commander. Uh, <clears throat> incorporations and affiliations are controlled by Article 17 of the bylaws. What are we talking about when we talk about uh, incorporations and affiliations? If the department wants to go out and partner with a, another organization for some specific purpose to promote uh, a particular program that's going to assist disabled veterans and their families and communities. Um, those have to meet with the approval of the national adjutant, um, and usually they're submitted by way of a um, a business plan, if you will. You know, DABA or DAB Department A wishes to partner with you know the Civic Society of Elkhart to promote a stand down. Um, those kind of affiliations and corporations would need to get the prior approval of the national organization. Why do we do that? Because we're an organization nearly 100 years old, and we've gotten this far because of our good name and the integrity uh, that we uphold within our organization. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, we get no funding from the government. Every single penny we get is from the general public, and it's based upon our reputation of providing service and our reputation and our integrity. So the very last thing that we want to have happen is for a department to enter into an affiliation or an corporation with another entity that is maybe not so well received within the community. Uh, we do a great deal of vetting to look at the history, who they are, what they do. We look at uh, any past media exposure um, because, again, the last thing we want to do is partner with somebody who's less than credible or has a very checkered past. Um, so we take those very seriously. And then, of course, once that's done, uh, if it's if, if everything checks out, then the National Agent will send a letter saying, absolutely, you guys are permitted to affiliate and incorporate with this organization to conduct this one particular event. One of the common questions that I'm asked all the time is, um, how are departments um, able to enforce the bylaws and oversee the activities of its chapters? Um, many times I get phone calls from department leaders that say, you know, hey, I wanted to go to chapter A's meeting last night to, um, you know, observe or provide some input or speak and they kicked me out. Well, obviously, the department is the parent of the chapter. All chapters within the department are uh, report to the department, and so any C Regulation 8 
uh, allows for departments to oversee and enforce the Constitution and bylaws of the all the chapters within its state. So um, chapters have no role, no decision, no authority to uh, not permit a department officer or a national officer to come in and speak to the body. Um, it's unfortunate that I even have to mention this, but there are some chapters out there that you know wish to do their own thing without any oversight, and they've gone so far as to not go to department conventions for years, and you know they're out there doing their own thing, satisfying the four meetings a year to justify their charter, but have no involvement with the department and uh, are all but separated uh, from the department. So um, chapters certainly are required to allow departments to come in, see their books, speak if need be, uh, take any correction act, corrective action, and enforce the bylaws of the national organization. Um, that also allows departments the opportunity to um, review their finances, their annual finance reports, ask questions, conduct an audit, uh, of their finances if they if the department believes that there's an issue that uh, needs to be addressed. Moving on here, so we're going to, uh, we spent a little bit of time here talking about departments, now we're going to move on to chapters. What are uh, some of the requirements? What are some of the uh, key points that are noted in the Constitution by all specific to chapters? Um, chapters must adopt First and foremost, its own constitution and bylaws, as outlined in Article uh, 9, Section 9.1. What does that mean? That means that uh, the chapter should proactively look at its current document, and that document should fit the needs of the chapter. Um, we have many chapters across the country whose constitution and bylaws date all the way back to the very beginning of its chapter's charter, which might be 50, 60 years ago. And you know what? That's not necessarily a bad thing, so long as it fits what is currently needed and being conducted at the chapter level at this time. However, it's certainly uh, uh, wise to, as your chapter grows, uh, extends new programs, uh, conducts uh, additional business, to take a look at those constitutional bylaws regularly to see if the current document meets the needs of the chapter today. Um, we actually have, and of course there's a lot of uh, required language that is uh, needed uh, in each chapter's constitution bylaws. There's required uh, language that is necessary for department's bylaws. We have sample uh, chapter constitution bylaws. We have sample department constitution bylaws that are available on DAB.org under the membership tab. Uh, you can use those, they're, they're writable Word documents. Uh, all of the required language that is required by the National Bylaws is already included in those samples, but you can amend it to include you know, certain specific committees that you might have at the chapter level. Uh, you can mold it into your own document as long as you don't take out any of that required language that already exists within the, within the, uh, the sample. Much like a department, uh, each and every year a chapter absolutely must conduct elections. That doesn't mean that uh, you know a commander or any other line officer can't succeed themselves. And again, these are all things that need to be outlined and specific in the Constitution and bylaws of the chapter. Um, it must specifically state that a chapter commander can succeed themselves year after year after year, or for two years or three years, or whatever the case might be. It must also identify whether the adjutant and treasurer are elected or appointed. Um, and um, it must also um, require that at least one junior vice commander um, be elected for the chapter. We have many chapters that are very large, very active. Some have four junior vice commanders, much like we have at the national organization. There are others that just have one. It's just based upon the size of the chapter, the involvement of the membership. Um, so that might be something that would really prompt the, um, uh, the need 
to review your constitution and bylaws. So if your current constitution and bylaws require that you have four junior vice commanders and you find yourself each and every year struggling to find that third and that fourth junior vice position to um, a body to fill that position, it might be a good time to amend your constitution and bylaws to only require one junior vice commander because that's all that is required by the way of the national bylaws. So when you get back, feel free to take a look at that <clears throat> sample that's online, uh, compare it with your current bylaws, see how far off base um, they may be, and it might be a good time just for this workable purposes to update those bylaws to ensure that A, you're in current compliance with the uh, national bylaws as to the current language, um, and then also it might help you better uh, conduct the business of your chapter by way of um, uh, some of the committees that you may have formed over the last 50 years since your chapter's been in existence. Um, because, of course, a lot of times we find ourselves in a position at a chapter level trying to figure out, well, what are we supposed to be doing as a committee? What are we supposed to be doing as an organization? And, of course, we look at our governing document, which is the bylaws, and it's really incomplete. It's absent because it's, a, it's an old document. So it never hurts to take a look at those um, and amend them and update them as necessary. Much like uh, departments, chapter officer reports are submitted within 10 days to um, the department and the national organization. Uh, and again, the reason that we need those officer reports is so that when we have a need to communicate an issue or communicate with the chapter, um, provide information, we need to know who we're sending it to so that at the next chapter meeting, that correspondence can be read by the, or the chapter adjutant to the body so that they can stay informed as to what's going on uh, in DAV, whether it's uh, specific to DAV, whether it's specific to certain legislation that is being considered or proposed by the federal government. Um, it's all about communication, right? Every time that uh, we typically have an issue between a chapter and a department, it's always a lack of communication. One thing that you'll never um, You'll never be able to say about a lack of communication with the national organization because we send out uh, communication on a daily basis to chapters, departments, is that you're not getting information. The only time that you can say that uh, you're not getting communication or information from the national organization is when that officer report has not been submitted or if the officer has changed um, during the course of that year uh, or there's been a change to an officer, um, of course that requires a new officer report. So if you're not getting correspondence from the national organization, it's probably because there's something missing on your officer report, it's not been updated, it's not been provided, and of course those officer reports need to be submitted within 10 days after the installation. And of course we know when each chapter has its annual election of officers, so if it uh, gets to be 30 days out we have not received that officer report yet we're surely going to send the chapter letter saying hey your elections were last month we've not received your officer report please provide it within the next 30 days or uh, the national commander may have to suspend the charter of your chapter uh, until we get that officer report with uh, new members um, Initial membership within DAV is governed by Section 11.2. Um, and I point this out just because it seems to be uh, not very well understood within chapters. Um, I look at a lot of constitutional bylaws prior to the National Judge Advocate finalizing them, reviewing them, and approving them. And many times I find within a chapter's constitution and bylaws a membership committee, and the sole purpose of that membership committee is to vet or require certain documentation uh, in order to accept an initial member, a new member, into the chapter. There shouldn't be any, any uh, membership committee, no documentation that's required by a chapter to consider someone for membership. If a new member comes in and wants to be a member of the chapter, uh, the chapter should immediately forward that to national headquarters, our, our membership specialists at national headquarters, 
vet those, review them, evaluate them, uh, ensure that they are eligible for membership in DAV, and then they are placed into the chapter. Transfers, on the other hand, are a different story. The chapter certainly has the right to determine on its own by way of a vote of the body who you're going to allow to transfer into, into a chapter. And the reason that uh, that uh, provision exists is because we all know that um, we have some members in chapters that aren't the most pleasant to deal with, that are always rough, or always, uh, uh, you know, kind of bucking the system, if you will. Uh, the last thing we want to do as a chapter is inherit somebody else's dirty laundry. So when it comes to transfers, um, the chapter certainly has the authority to consider, discuss, and vote on whether or not they're going to allow an individual uh, member to transfer into their chapter. That uh, last bullet point there, use of membership information, of course, as leaders of DAV, whether you're the chapter commander, the chapter adjutant, um, the service officer, uh, anybody who has access to the membership list of the chapter, we absolutely positively must safeguard that. Article 19, section 19.2 specifically states that that membership list is to be protected and shall only be used for the business purposes of the chapter. Um, we should not be renting that list to businesses. We should not be providing that list to other organizations so that they can solicit our members for membership in another organization or solicit them for business. Um, we have to safeguard that, that list. Uh, at the end of the day, these are our members. Uh, we do not want our members to be taken advantage of in any way, shape, or form. We don't want them to feel pressured into joining another organization. We don't want them to feel pressured into buying a particular product that has been, um, uh, that, is, that is local there. So that membership list absolutely positively must be safeguarded and used solely for the purpose of providing information as it relates to the DAV chapter. Any and all fundraising activities of chapters, with a few exceptions, um, they're all governed by Article 15, Section 15.3 of the Fly Laws, must get the prior approval of the Department Executive Committee, with the exception, much like a Department of uh, Golden Crown activities that the chapter might be involved with and uh, Forgive Me Not uh, drives. Uh, anything else that is done that in involves the general public um, must meet with the prior approval of the Department Executive Committee. And in a few rare cases, may even require the approval of the National Executive Committee, just depending upon what kind of fundraiser it is, if there's some kind of a contract that's involved, um, those things would require the review and the consideration of the National Executive Committee. But keep in mind as a chapter, you know, we're all reportable to somebody, so chapters always must get the prior approval of the department for fundraisers. Departments always need to get the approval of the National Executive Committee for fundraisers. Um, so let's just keep that in mind. The only caveat to that is if you're at a chapter meeting, you're conducting a, uh, uh, a raffle or something with uh, the members that are present at the meeting, those kind of things do not require the approval of uh, the department. Um, so long as the anticipated amount uh, does not exceed $5,000. There seems to be a little bit of confusion about what the ability of a chapter is to do a fundraiser as it relates to that $5,000 reference that's mentioned in the bylaws. That is specific to a raffle. And I can't imagine that there's going to be any raffle in any chapter where you're going to bring in more than $5,000. But if you do have a raffle, it's going to bring in more than $5,000 from the members present voting at a chapter meeting. That certainly would need to get the approval of the Department Executive Committee. But keep in mind, anything that involves the general public, anything outside the DAV membership at a chapter meeting, requires the approval of the Department Executive Committee, regardless of the amount that's anticipated to bring in. Even if you're only expecting to bring in $100, as a, as a in, in, uh, total proceeds from the fundraiser. If it involves the general public, the prior approval of the Department of Executive Committee is required. Annual finance reports are also on the same reporting year's departments. 
uh, we all operate on, at, at the chapter department level on the membership year of July 1 to June 30. So September 30th is the deadline for annual financial reports to be into departments. Each and every chapter must file a, an annual financial report to the department. If the chapter has income which exceeds $10,000, during the course of the year, then a copy of that financial report must come to the national headquarters as well. And similar to departments, any chapter that receives over $300,000 of income minus anything that might come from the national organization must also file a CPA review. Um, that covers everything that I wanted to address, and my next slide here goes into Q&A, but uh, Mr. Coher here is going to come up and address some uh, other issues as related to fundraiser or fundraising. And whenever he's finished, uh, any and all questions can be addressed from the microphone up here. And uh, before you address your questions, just please make sure that you identify whether the question is for Brian or myself, and uh, we'll get to those as soon as he's finished. All right. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. All right, so fundraising today, this is what, these are some of the topics that I'm gonna to cover today. Um, fundraising nationally has some very large programs that we execute on a national level. You've probably seen our television commercials, direct mailings, um, we have some digital campaigns we execute on a national level. I'm not really gonna talk about those things today, I'm really gonna focus more on the fundraising related activities that can benefit you and impact you on a department and chapter level. If you do want to hear more about those things, I'm happy to talk about those things. And, uh, by all means, please come up and see me afterwards and we'd be happy to talk to you about what we're doing at a national level, but I figure out for you if I can talk a whole lot about those things. Um, but before I get into these topics, I do want to make a public service announcement um, about something else which isn't necessarily fundraising related but benefits you, and that's our member advantages benefits program. We, we um, have done a lot of due diligence and put a lot of effort into revamping um, the partner, corporate partner benefits that you all can take advantage of in terms of getting discounts as relates to your membership off of products and services. And so we have pretty much started from scratch and bring on new partners. And so we're excited we have new partners like 1-800-Flowers where you can get discounts off of all their products and T-Mobile and um, Identity Guard, and USAA, Hand Cooked Tires, and, um, and soon to be Avis and Budget. So I just encourage you all to go out, um, look out on the membership portal at the new uh, Member Advantages Partnership account. Take advantage of those discounts because they're there for you. It's part of your benefits uh, as being members. Also, we still, I believe, have a table out by the registration area with a brochure. You can pick up a brochure on all of our partners and get a discount. So, just a little public service announcement on that. Please um, look into that and take advantage of those things um, as much as as much as possible. Now, all right. So let's talk about our vehicle donation program. So we started our vehicle donation program um, nationally about three years ago. We raised four hundred forty-six thousand dollars in the first year in two thousand sixteen. Last year we raised over eight hundred thousand dollars, as you can see here from about 3,000 cars that were donated are in 43 states. Now, as many of you may know, is we actually donate a, a large percentage of the, the proceeds that come from these cars back to the departments. And so, 25% of the proceeds. So, this year we're on track to actually raise over a million dollars, which means that $250,000 will be going back to the departments uh, for this particular program. You can see here where all the cars are being donated from. Some state departments are getting as much as uh, four, over $40,000 in funds back from this program. 10 of the states are getting over $10,000. Three of the states are getting over $25,000. So we're getting donations in from all the states. You can see the ones that are really driving the top four, Minnesota, California, Virginia, Maryland. Um, we encourage you all to take advantage of promoting the program. Those states that are at the top promote the, the program heavily. Um, we provide an easy mechanism to promote the program. Uh, if you go to the membership portal, there's tools, there's flyers, there's posters, 
We have messaging, so if you want to send things out, emails out, we have messaging. We have messaging put on social media. We also have things that you can order if you want to have tchotchke items. Um, but again, this is just another easy way to, uh, to bring in some revenue for your organization. And um, here's some sample digital ads here that you can post on, on your website. So um, please, uh, we, we thank, thank you for encouraging the program. It's doing phenomenally well and I encourage you to continue to, um, to promote it as well. So Just Be Kids, does everyone know about the Just Be Kids program? No? No? So Just Be Kids is the program that we uh, implemented a few years ago that allows chapters and departments to raise funds to support Camp Corral. Camp Corral is a program that we do in partnership with Golden Corral to send kids of military members and veterans uh, to camp for free and they put a priority in sending the kids to camp for fallen and injured and ill veterans. Uh, we're really excited that we have partnered with Camp Corral pretty much since the onset of the program starting. Uh, Just Be Kids was created as a mechanism to allow you to fundraise for Camp Corral. Um, anytime that you go out and raise funds as a representative of DAB, as Ed mentioned, those funds must be accounted for by DAB. Um, so you can't simply go out and raise funds and then turn those monies over to another entity, another organization, without them being accounted for first by the organization. And so by raising funds and then allocating to Just Be Kids, we then allocate the money to Camp Corral. So the money comes into DAB as part of the Just Be Kids scholarship program, and then we allocate it back out to Camp Corral. Um, not only does this allow you to adhere to our bylaws, but it also ethically is something that we have to do. If we're out there collecting money from the public under the guise of DAV, their expectation is those funds are going to DAV, so they must go to DAV first and foremost. This past year, I'm excited to say that, uh, which you may have heard yesterday, that the DAV chapters and departments this year raised over $300,000 to send kids to camp. So that is outstanding. Combined with National and the Auxiliary, we actually raised over $600,000 to send kids to camp. So over 1,000 kids are going to be coming going to camp. Uh, almost a third of the kids are going to camp this summer because of the efforts of DAV. Um, many of you may know that the first $300,000 that are raised by departments and chapters are matched by DAV headquarters. Um, this year was the first year we exceeded the $300,000 match. So, it's important that you get the money in because it's done on a first come, first serve basis. So, but once we reach 300,000, we don't map, we don't continue to match donations from chapters um, and departments. So I encourage you to get those in as soon as possible um, so that you can get double the credit. And if you're doing fundraising on behalf of Golden Crowd, I know the stores find that to be very important to them to sort of double those funds so they can get double the credit. Speaking of the Golden Corral partnership and the fundraising that you do with those stores. A lot of times we hear, well, how do the stores get credit or shouldn't we give the money to Golden Corral? And the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> Please do not ever give the money to, to Golden Corral. Um, as I stated, it must come to us first. But on the flip side, we want to ensure that Golden Corral does get credit for the funds that you raise in their stores. So anytime you send in the funds, this is the form that you can utilize, that you should utilize to send the funds back into uh, to DAV headquarters. On there, you'll see there's a spot that says if you're raising funds in partnership with a Golden Corral store, to please put the name of the store, the store number, how much you raised in partnership with the store, and then we then send that information back to Golden Corral to make sure that the stores get credit. And if those funds are matched, we also report back on the total amount, including the match that's reported back to uh, Golden Corral. So, um, this is the fund, uh, the form that you should use. If you don't, um, if you can't, don't have access to that, um, you can reach out to uh, Shonda Holland um, at our headquarters office or email address is sholland at dab.org. You can also reach out to me and I'll make sure that you can get this form as well. Also, we do have, one of the things we heard a couple years ago was we're out there raising money for just the kids from Camp Crowd, but we don't have anything that actually speaks to it and talks about the program. So we now do have materials. We have actually a bucket that you can order that's an inventory. We also have a brochure that talks about the Just the Kids Scholarship Program. So you can access that off of the membership portal 
where you can access the toolkit, which tells you how to download and gain access to this information as you're going out and fundraising uh, on behalf of Just Be Kids support and for out. And I think you saw this slide yesterday. There's a lot of a lot of departments, a lot of chapters raising money for Camp Crowd, which is which is great, and it's very much appreciated. And then you heard yesterday from Camp Crowd and how much they appreciate it. I can tell you, the kids certainly did. Could you back up? Could you back that? Sure. Please, sure. It's not in any particular order, so we're maybe alphabetical. So um, it's not in order by who raised the most. Ready? All right. Nope. Got slow camera users. All right. We'll be we'll be doing training on cell phone photos after after this. <laughs> So, so the other thing I wanted to highlight that many of you may not know is Kroger actually has a very easy fundraising campaign program that you guys can take advantage of. Um, Kroger actually will donate a percentage of uh, sales when you go grocery shopping, if you have a local Kroger in your area, uh, back to your chapter or department. It's very easy to do, to take advantage of. All you literally have to do is go to this website which I have here and then register your chapter or department simple as that. You click on the state, you find the store, you register your, your chapter department, they send you an ID. It's as simple as that. Once you have that information, you can then go in and actually have your, tell your members that you've registered your organization and they can go in and actually assign their Kroger Plus card to your chapter and organization. Again, this is how you can do that and then every time they use their card, it goes back to your chapter, goes back to your chapter or department. So, Again, all, I, I, all Kroger subsidiaries. All Krogers do this. All. And their, their other main source. Yes. So I know I hear a lot of times, how do we? What's some easy ways to raise money? This is it can get no easier than this. Um, as a way to just people shop, they do their normal grocery shopping, you receive you receive proceeds. So um, I just want to make sure you, you all are aware this is something that Kroger does on a national level. If you can, either after after we're done with the presentation, you can either get my card or Ed's card, and we will email you the presentation. So don't worry about taking pictures. We'll come up afterwards, and we'll make sure that we get you the presentation because we can have access to all this information. The, the other thing that um, we're proud to be launching again is our DV 5K National Series, which is, has kicked off, and we are excited um, to once again be hosting our 5K series this year. Um, me, you may know that uh, this series is designed to raise awareness of the challenges that ill and injured, Ill and injured veterans face and to say thank you to those who have served. Um, it is an awesome experience for those of you who have gone to a DV 5K. It's like no other, it's a special experience. Uh, we have honor bid for who can honor their loved ones and friends and family. We have a motorcycle ride kickoff and an awesome after party. Um, so we're very excited. Last year we had about 9,000 participants. Yes. Yes. We're going to, if you can hold your questions to the very end, if you don't mind, and then come up to the microphone as well when you do it at the end. Please. Alright, so, um, so we're excited to kick off this year's campaign. Registration is open. You can go to db5k.org um, to register. Um, again, proceeds from these events do go back to the departments themselves. Um, so we encourage your participation. Uh, you don't have to live in those states together. Um, this is this is the schedule for our 5K events. The first weekend is Saturday, November the 3rd. You'll see we have Houston highlighted. Last year we were in San Antonio. This year we're moving the Texas 5K to Houston. We had an opportunity to partner with a huge event in Houston. Actually, it's in Kima, which is outside of Houston, but to partner with a big event there that uh, costs them to service that um, basically honors veterans as well, but they have 12,000 participants and they're gonna cross promote our event with theirs. So we're gonna be in Houston this year for the first time we're excited about. We'll also be in Tulsa that weekend. The following weekend we'll be in Newport News and then we'll conclude uh, the 5K this year 
on November the 10th, but Atlanta, Boston, and Cincinnati. So uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing all of you um, at one of the, the 5K events this year. I can tell you if you want to not freeze, you might not want to go to Boston, though. It's a, uh, hey. it's a little cold. It's a little cold. <laughs> it's not here. November 10th? My blood is thin, so that's all I can say. But Boston has a great event. It's in a fort. It's fun. It's phenomenal. It's a truly awesome experience. So I was kidding. Um, and once again, we're doing our member challenge um, this year. Um, for our members, you guys may have seen during the business session this morning, we honored our two awardees. Uh, the top member uh, individual team, uh, top individual member fundraiser. And we also honored the top team member fundraiser this morning. We're doing that again this year. The winners receive free airfare and hotel for themselves and a guest to convention. So more incentive to go out and raise money for the 5Ks. And again, you don't have to live in that state. You can go pick a, pick a state that you want to raise money for. Um, and you can uh, hopefully be one of these winners. Last but not least, I wanted to highlight our another program that we've been doing for several years now with Ford called Ford's Drive for Your Community. Uh, program. This program is another very simple way to raise money. All you literally have to do is go to a Ford dealership, tell them you want to participate in their Ford Drive for Community program and put on an event. They pick a day where they will do the event, and on that day, any test drive, we you would receive $20 uh, for each test drive up to $6,000. We would really like to see more people take advantage of this. You'll see in a second, the ones who are taking advantage of it, how much money they raise. Um, it's not hard to do. Once you go in and you get them to say yes, I will do that. Um, there's information on, if you go to the membership portal on how to register for, for, the, um, for the event. But once you register and you have the, the event, that day it's as simple as telling all your friends, all your chapter department members, whatever, to come out and test drive. That's all they have to do to get $20. It's very simple. Um, so take advantage of this as well. We have information out on the portal about the Drive for Your Community program, about how you can promote it. We have flyers and uh, email messages that are already drafted that you can send out to your membership on how to do this. You can see the, the eight, nine chapters that have done that. Raised $20,000, those nine chapters. So you can see some of them raised quite a bit of money. Again, it's not it's easy to do, easy money. I encourage everyone. We'd like to see way more chapters taking advantage of uh, that part was taking advantage of this program so so please do and again all of um if you go out on the portal you can see all of the resources that we have out there for drive for your community and for the donation vehicle donation program for the member challenge so if you need information on how to go about engaging and participating in any of these programs please go out to the membership portal and then um last but not least at least i have a favor to ask of you as well um, you may have heard yesterday, uh, a &W, you guys, everybody get a root beer float from a &W yesterday? No. no! What happened? Did they, they didn't run out, did they? Huh? Well, we'll be doing it again next year, so <laughs> get a float. Come back next year. But um, a and is raising money for DAV in their stores um, up through National Root Beer Float Day, August 6th. Um, just many, we've reached out to chapters and departments to say, hey, would you help us by going out and saying thank you on National Root Beer Float Day to them, as well as its patrons for donating to us. And many of you raised your hands and got back to us and said, yes, I'll do that. And we thank you. We had over 300, I think, people uh, say we'll do that. I thank you for that. Um, if you'd like to still do that, we'd much appreciate it. I know a &W would appreciate it. It helps us raise more money. So come see me if you're interested in doing that. Um, and uh, we certainly would appreciate your support. Um, that concludes my presentation. I guess we can now take, take questions. Ed and I, if you have questions, please just come up to the, to the microphone up here and introduce, introduce yourself and you have, we have 30 minutes.